so we're moving from uh, a couple of very uh, common situations in thoracic surgery to a, a very uncommon situation in thoracic surgery. I'd like to thank the uh, club for the opportunity to present our work today. Uh, we have no disclosures relative to this uh, presentation. So as we all know, surgery in the chest is, is somewhat of a balancing act between our ability to see as surgeons and see what we're, what we're working on and the physiology of the patient. The exposure issue is something that we've put a lot of work into and we've got a lot of techniques from the simple things like bringing another intern to the operating room to pull a little harder on the lung to selective lung ventilation either in the form of a double lumen tube or endobronchial blocker. But the ventilation issues are, are sometimes a little bit more difficult to control. They're dependent very much upon the physiology of the patient as well as the anatomy of the injury that you're there to repair. This can be something is dealt with in, in simple ways such as increasing the inspired oxygen or putting a little bit of, of extra peep on the down lung or in the situation of an interrupted airway can require much more advanced techniques of airway management with jet ventilation, cross table ventilation in some circumstances and at the very far end of that spectrum is extracorporeal support either in the form of cardiopulmonary bypass or ECMO. ECMO is something which has been considered a bit of a dirty word in thoracic surgery, largely because of the patients where we've applied it in the past. These have been in the setting of severe chest trauma, post-traumatic ARDS or primary respiratory failure, or in the setting of lung transplantation, those patients undergoing uh, difficult post-transplant courses with primary graft dysfunction. In other words, these are compromised patients, and with compromised patients oftentimes come poor outcomes. Hence the kind of bad rap that ECMO has, I think, in the minds of a lot of clinicians. However, in the operating room, there is an increasing trend to look at ECMO as a tool rather than a bailout procedure. Uh, it's increasingly used in the setting of, of cardiopulmonary transplantation, especially lung transplantation, and there's early data indicating that you actually see improved postoperative graft function as well as reduction in rates of bleeding both intraoperatively and postoperatively with the use of ECMO as compared to cardiopulmonary bypass in a traditional sense. However, in the general thoracic literature, there is very little data. There are several case reports of, of the use of ECMO in the setting of trauma and traumatic injuries. And one retrospective multi-institution survey that was presented at the ESTS of several institutions in France indicating that there is starting to be some penetration into the general thoracic world as well. Our goal with this study was to evaluate the use of ECMO in the operating room in support of general thoracic surgical procedures. We looked at our institutional experience from 2004 to 2014 looking at our procedural codes to identify cases where ECMO was used in the setting of general thoracic procedures. And we stratified these patients into three groups. Those who had ECMO instituted pre-surgically, it was 12 patients. Those where ECMO was used specifically intraoperatively, instituted in the operating room in support of the operation. And those uh, where it was used postoperatively, this would be more the rescue situation. When we looked at those, we excluded those 12 pre-surgical patients because those were all patients who had recently had a lung transplant. Very different group. They were going back for evacuation of hemothoraces or open lung biopsies, etc. Charts were independently reviewed looking at the operative indications, the patient demographics, as well as the ECMO cannulation strategy and the duration. And we looked specifically at uh, outcomes of survival at 30 days, 90 days, and one year the disposition at discharge, and the rates of complications varying among these patients. Within the group that was cannulated intraoperatively, kind of really the study group here, the mean age was 49 and a half, slightly more female than male, and the pathology was quite variable. Five patients with uh, post-resection tracheoesophageal fistulae, uh, three patients who had bronchopleural fistulae after uh, lung resection, uh, one patient with a tracheal tumor, one patient who had uh, significant intraoperative respiratory uh, compromise likely due to a pulmonary embolism uh, in the midst of a minimally invasive esophagectomy, and two patients who had traumatic airway injuries. So looking at our cannulation strategy, the majority of these patients were uh, supported with venovenous ECMO, uh, 10 as opposed to two who had uh, arteriovenous cannulation in the setting, one of these in the setting of trauma, the other in the setting of the, uh, uh, the pulmonary embolus. For the uh, VV ECMO uh, patients, our approach was a uh, right internal jugular vein, right femoral cannulation, and uh, 
peripheral cannulation for the AV ECMO cases. Looking a little bit at the, uh, the patient disposition, uh, you can see many of these cases had a very long uh, ICU stay, indicating these are truly the more complex end of, of patients that we see, but many of them were able actually to, I can't get the pointer to work, but many of these patients were able to, to um, get directly home from the hospital. And of those who were, uh, were discharged to long-term care facilities, all of them eventually were able to discharge home. However, looking at the, uh, the outcomes, 30-day 30 uh, survival was uh, quite good, over 90%. 90-day survival, uh, slightly lower. One-year survival remained relatively consistent at 70%. When we look at the complication rates, many of these were things related to the primary respiratory failure. High rates of pneumonia, the incidence of tracheostomy was relatively high in this group. And again, I put the post-operative ECMO patients up there as a means of comparison more so than anything else. Complications themselves were relatively low. Cannulation site bleeding uh, in 25% of patients, two of whom actually required operative repairs. One, for one, uh, one was one of the arteriovenous ECMO patients who required a, a femoral artery repair at the time of cannula removal. And the other was a patient who had uh, venovenous cannulation, had an IJ injury, which just required replacement of the cannula. <coughs> so this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve is meant really just as a kind of pictorial uh, representation of what we just discussed. And you can see in the, the red line below is what we see as our survival with the traditional post-operative rescue ECMO strategy. Many of these patients not doing well in the early term, but if you get them through that first period, not a huge drop off in survival thereafter. This is a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison, and I don't want you to walk away thinking that this is what we're trying to do is compare these two groups directly. It's more meant as a point of reference. And you can see that when we choose to use ECMO as an intraoperative strategy, as a tool, you actually can see reasonable survival. There are several limitations in this study. It's retrospective in nature, and we did not have, at the time of the study period, a defined protocol a priori for the institution of ECMO. In many cases, this is sort of surgeon discretion, and we became much more comfortable and aggressive using it in the latter part of the study period as opposed to the early part of the study period. <coughs> as I just discussed, the intraoperative and postoperative groups are, are quite heterogeneous, and we can't directly compare the outcomes, but again, more put up as a point of reference. And finally, I think in a very self-evident way, this is an uncommon procedure. So we have a very small cohort of patients with which to look at. And of course, there is an element of selection bias that comes in. So what do we take away from this? What do we conclude? I, I think really the message that I want to get across is that ECMO can safely be used as an intraoperative strategy for support. When conventional ventilation is either difficult or in some cases impossible to provide with a low complication profile, and a survival which is superior to what we all traditionally think of as ECMO as a rescue strategy. As with most things that are uncommon, patient selection really becomes key. And I think one thing that, that really needs to be talked about when you're, when you're thinking about using ECMO is it's not just the intraoperative management of these patients that's important, but the multidisciplinary postoperative management is key to a good outcome. <coughs> We're very fortunate to have an excellent ICU staff, which is also very used to dealing with these patients and uh, I think that's a key thing when you're looking at, at institutional resources and choice of tools to use. So what's the take home point? ECMO is not a four letter word but it's a tool that can be used appropriately when patients are selected. Thank you very much. <laughs>